Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Thomas Keegan again with uh, LibertarianProgressive.com, uh, where we're conducting a 2012 candidate interviews uh, with independent third party uh, candidates. So you can make a fully informed or a more informed decision by knowing more of your options. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, I usually have a frame of how to set things up. We usually ask about the candidate, the issues. Um, and, uh, and and then go beyond into some other questions. But um, I was just today before this, RJ, I was thinking about, um, uh, and I'll introduce you also here, but um, it, and that's the guest who we have today is RJ Harris running for the US Congress in 2012 out of um, Oklahoma. And uh, so that is um, for the uh, fourth district and he's running against um, Tom Cole um, and uh, Donna Bebo, a Republican and a Democrat. But uh, it seems like to me the Republican and the Democrat Party, um, it's kind of like, have you, you know how some relationships end where one person can't just say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm through with it, so they just do bad things so the other person gets sick of them? I, I think maybe that's what the Republicans and the Democrats are doing. I mean, they're voting for the NDAA, they're, they're voting for the Patriot Act, they're wasting all their money, they're, they're trying to tell you, they just can't tell you face to face because they're a politician, so they're like, maybe if I do this, they'll elect me out of office, but no one's listening to them. Um, but uh, that's just a, a thought. Um, but our Jay, good to talk to you. He's a, a, a veteran in the National Guard, had uh, three tours, um, one peaceful one and, and one in um, uh, combat, and uh, or two in combat, and a small business owner, um, and someone who uh, cares about the U.S. and the Constitution. It's a pleasure to talk to you today, uh, RJ, and uh, it, if you could share with us what motivates you and, um, you know, just a little bit about what uh, drives you to uh, be in this election and uh, and be ready on November 7th, if called, to become the next uh, representative from the great state of uh, Oklahoma in uh, District 4. Well, thank you for that awesome introduction and for having me on, the, on your interview. And... Um, but in direct answer to your question, what drives me uh, is a absolute, you know, and to motivates me to be running for office is an absolute burning desire to see our liberty restored, to see our republic restored, and to see Constitution come forth. Um, it really just burns me up that uh, our, our freedom is eroded to the degree that it has in the last many decades, and that our government just continues to operate well beyond the, the bounds and constraints of the Constitution, and that um, and that uh, more and more of our personal, individual, and economic liberties are stolen from us every single day. And so, um, I'm in this race to restore freedom, liberty, the Constitution, and the Republic, and that's not just the catchphrase. That's what drives me. Yeah, eventually people are going to realize, like, something's got to give, and, um, and so... I just think, you know, one of the easiest ways we can start restoring this republic and this country that we care about um, is uh, the thing that we're all taught to do or, or that, you know, it's kind of a civic responsibility is, is to vote and, and, and get involved in uh, politics and um, champion people and, and, and nominate people and, and, and support um, candidates that uh, stand on the issues. I thought it was, you know, supposed to be about the issues and that we're all equal under the law and um, you, you know that this isn't just a fairy tale that we're living in it's actually real it's called the United States of America and um, so it, it's it, so I mean that's a good reason to get involved I, I you know feel passionately about that and I admire you for doing that actually I, I you know was um, uh, looking at your campaign two years ago and, and thought that was great uh, and so one point is um, it doesn't matter if you're from Oklahoma listening to this right now I don't care if you're like in Montana or Maine or California um, you, you know there's like look at Ron Paul he's from Texas but he still represented a large group of people that you know had uh, 
of voices that needed to be heard. And um, so the issues are important. I mean, I suppose, um, well, what are our options as far as, uh, what do you see as, uh, you, you know, the state of the budgets and our options as far as financially, um, you know, maybe in a monetary sense, RJ? Okay. Um, well, the, the place that we've come to right now is, um, and when you talk about budgets and you talk about monetary policy, is that we've, we've allowed this government to literally, and, and the bankers that are behind it, to spend us into, God, close to $100 trillion in debt. And... A hundred trillion dollars? Wow. That's... And I say that because, you know, you've got the 18 to 20 that they admit, but then you got to add in another 16, 18, 20 that they talk about um, was loaned out to foreign banks, which have to be paid back. So then, you know, you've got to understand, you've got to see that these people play these shell games. They tell you, okay, well, this is the, this is the debt. Well, what about all this other stuff that you loaned out? Oh, and then on top of that, what about the unfunded mandates that are going to come due between now and 2020? Okay, so not, not, not unfunded mandates, but the unfunded liabilities. Okay. Well, yeah, that's the kind of issues I like to hear about, you know. Um, you know, you can't yeah. just talk about, you can't just talk about what you owe today when you know that you owe more tomorrow. Okay, you can't just do that. Well, that's what our government does. It's like, oh, our, you know, the debt clock is 15 trillion. Yeah, whatever. Okay, that's what we owe today. But there's an amount that's owed tomorrow, and we know that, we, that what that amount is, you know. I mean, it's just not honest money doing it like that. I mean, it's to, to say it in layman's terms, right? I mean, isn't it, I guess it's not just a principle. It actually has practical uses by having honest money. And, and so, and so, and I talked about this when I was running for president, and that is a little band-aids aren't going to do Little, little changes, little um, coveralls. Yeah, Band-Aid's not going to do when your arm's broken and it's like dangling there. It looks like you have two elbows, you know. What we're going to have to do is get drastic about res returning this government back down to its constitutional size. So eliminating all unconstitutional programs, eliminating all unconstitutional spending, and, um, and, um, you know, restoring, you know, eliminating things like the the income tax and all these other taxes that drive. Wouldn't that be an advertisement for America? Um, uh, c welcome, bring your business here. Um, the place, the land where there is no income tax. I mean, I, I see we would have an, uh, an immigration problem of businesses coming over. Yes, yes, we would. And, and I was just talking to, I was on a conference call with Gary Johnson and, and Judge Gray and some other people a few days ago, and and they said the same thing. You know, they talked to some executives uh, over at, I can't remember what the company was, maybe with my gear, one of these other places, and they were they were like, well, man, my gosh, if we actually ended the income tax, they were talking about you know, the, the amount of investment that would come pouring back in the United States. There's all these um, entrepreneurs and, and business people from around the world said, oh, shoot, let's come back to the United States and reinvest here. Well, we're not going to have to pay income tax. Well, I mean, of course, people want to say, well, how, you know, how am I going to fund the government? Well, I've, I've said all along that I will not, you know, especially as far back as my presidential campaign, that I support a very small capped uh, corporate income tax because corporations are not citizens. They're entities. They're legal fictions created by our government. Well, um, now, Gary Johnson supports the, um, whatchamacallit, the uh, fair tax, the sales tax, just getting rid of the income tax. Do you think that's also or just the corporate um, tax? Um, me personally, I advocate for just a 10% a corporate profit tax and no other form of taxation whatsoever. That's a, that's a lot less than it is now, actually, and yeah, and tends an yeah. easy number to round off too. So. so not not only are you not only do I advocate you know ending all personal income tax, but even the corporate tax rate gets reduced under my plan. But of course, of course, none of that works if you don't get rid of the bloated government. Okay, you have to get rid of all that too. You have to get rid of all the unconstitutional wasteful government as well. Um, and I said this time and time again, you know, imagine what 
our economy could do if it was no longer paying for trillions upon trillions of dollars worth and of drugs. And picking winners and losers, right? Imagine if it wasn't paying trillions of dollars to fight interventionist foreign wars around the world. Imagine if it wasn't paying for trillions of dollars in drug war. Imagine if it was not paying for all these uh, socialistic programs. I mean, if you were to unburden the American economy, stop taxing the American people into poverty, um, stop all of the, you know, the deficit or the, um, uh, the, um, yeah, the deficit spending, um, which, which is part of the, the, the cycle of money creation, where they're, you know, where they go and borrow themselves more money, and I mean, if yeah, we're stop, the tune of we're borrowing what forty cents or forty three cents out of every dollar is what we're borrowing right now. You, you'd have to, if you stopped all of that. Then you could actually write the chip, but it, you're not going to write it just to plug in a leak here and a band-aid there. That's not going to that's not going to save the Titanic. No, that it, band-aid's definitely not going to save the Titanic. That's for sure. I mean, that was um, you know a well-built machine that. Uh, uh, if a Band-Aid could save it, then it wouldn't be called the Titanic. Um, and, um, w well, uh, that's and a tax isn't just a financial tax. I mean, it also saps energy and, and, and just um, some, you know, potential motivation out of people possibly and, and just knowing that they have to do all these forms and stuff. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a tax. Um, it's uh, kind of a, besides just financially, it's also a tax. And, um, and well, now you, you mentioned something asking me about Governor Johnson's fair tax proposal or that he supports it. And I need to make something very clear that I don't think he's referring to the current version of that plan, which is, you know, the current. You know, right, the right. Plan. They actually have a website or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't think he's referring to that. I think he's referring to a consumption tax concept. Okay. And, and I will go so far as to say that, yes, that is constitutional. Um, consumption taxes do exist in the Constitution. And I know there's some libertarians out there that are going to get all mad at me and everything, but remember, I'm a constitutional libertarian first. I'm not an anarchist. So I do expect there to be, have to be some small government. Well, um, but, you know, as far as it applies to your question about, you know, comparing me to Gary Johnson and his support for a fair tax, do I think it's a constitutional tax? Yes, I do. I'm really, really about using it. I don't. Not just that. I mean, I think it's a kind of a neat concept, too. Um, but, um, but the you know, corporate tax, that, you know, I wouldn't be against that. I mean, I think, you know, either of them what are I, better than what we have now. And so, uh, what, what I'm going to do is look at a funding, a, funding, a funding tool, a funding mechanism that, that doesn't take the, in the, the income of sovereign citizens. It doesn't steal our labor. It doesn't, you know, take from people, um, you know, of course, a lot of people would say, well, yeah, if you have a consumption-based tax, then, no, then then everybody can pay their fair share, which means you could actually have a much lower tax rate because more people are paying into it instead of less. And so all those things make sense. I mean, those, those are going to be all the positives that they push for it. Um, I do think there's, there's a huge Pandora's box that could be opened with it, um, but, um, but I, I don't really knock uh, Governor Johnson for, for having that. Uh, that idea for that plan. I mean, I think it's a better, it's a way better idea than, than you get from the Republicans or the Democrats. Um, but it, it would be a big weight off people's, you know, it'd be a burden lifted off, like uh, not having it. And, and the sales tax, I mean, I think it would maybe take a couple of years for prices to adjust, but prices, I think, would adjust to it. And, um, and, and some sales tax ones, there's all different fair kinds of sales tax things. I mean, some have vouchers and things like that in it. And uh, so, um, but yeah, that's, uh, y you know, I think a serious discussion at, at least. And um, but, as a, but as a candidate for congressional office, I can say, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, especially, here, you know, if we put ourselves into the hypothetical where Governor Johnson is president and I'm in Congress and he's trying to get this fair tax agenda through, and might I support it as a bridge? Somebody said, well, what about as a bridging strategy to get to my my goal? And I'm like, well, okay, I could give you that, um, because you want to... Yeah, this is better than 999, too, is because um, it, it, it doesn't, like, include three kinds of taxes. It's just this tax, and that's it. All right. 
That's oh, yeah, make, make, make no mistake. You know, the only way uh, that, would, that, uh, that proposal would work in my opinion is if you eliminated all the income taxes. You didn't even have a 999 on the table, and that was all that they were using as their funding mechanism. But again, I think that if we actually followed through on the constraints which are contained within the Constitution, we could fund this entire government and our defense needs um, with, like I was saying, a small 10% corporate uh, profit tax. And my God, imagine you know the, the the uptake, the upswing in prosperity across this nation. If there were none of these other taxes, um, heck, a corporation would have to it would have to try to lose money to not be able to show a profit. I mean, it would just it would. Yeah, there would be companies out there that are still failing and you know not doing a very good job. But I mean, my goodness, there would be nothing in their way anymore. There would be, you know. Yeah, it would be like a garden that was like had a tent over it for a while, and and, and just all of a sudden someone you know decided to remove that tent, and and now it's yeah. like just you know growing. It just sprouts up. Yeah. It just sprouts up, and so and so um, so that's I'm going to stick with that. I, I I'd love to. I'm going to continue to press for that as a congressional candidate. Um, of course, I've got to win over another 434 members of the Congress to even you know. Yeah, these aren't just metaphors, too, like let the sunlight in. I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, you do need light to see things, and um, and we do need transparency, and th things need space to breathe and, and be free, and, and that's the same with our economy. People need that, and uh, that helps them be prosperous, you know. I think. Uh, and then covered accountant's defense. If he had his way and he got a consumption tax through, capped at, let's say, 10 or 11%, and all other taxes were removed, yeah. things would get a whole lot better fast around here, too. Again, the same thing would happen. All these right. entrepreneurs, right. all these business people that have taken their money to Singapore or to China or to these other places as haven, they'd all come back. Oh, yeah, people would be complaining back. that um, we're getting all the money at that point, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I guess there's really just a difference of different you know, maybe tactics here. I mean, so that's, yeah, no, that's, that's cool. And, and that's in America's best interest. I mean, that, that's the bottom line, right? You're, that's, you're doing it because it's in America's best interest. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I mean, it, it, and, uh, yeah, that would make a huge difference. And what about, like, you're a veteran, and, um, and uh, you, you know, what about the military budgets? I mean, uh, is that, do you think... Um, yeah, that should be audited, and uh, and, w and what do you think about it? Oh, certainly. I mean, I support audit auditing and ending the Federal Reserve. Now, I don't support ending the military, but I definitely support auditing it mm -hmm. and finding out where everything has gone in the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, and um, I think we'd see an immediate savings if we ended all these interventionist foreign policy, or uh, this interventionist foreign policy, and of course Ron Paul said that a thousand times, there's a huge amount of savings that, that occur even without cutting the actual military budget itself, just cutting all the interventionism out. Saves actually way more than the defense budget. But, but I even think that there's more to be saved once you stop the interventionism. Um, I envision a constitutional military which is based around our Army and Air National Guard, which is the militia and is allowed to be perpetually funded and trained and disciplined by the Congress, okay? And you get you get 10 times, maybe even 15 times the combat power uh, for the price, for oh, the money. Anyone that would with attack us would be obliterated. So, I mean, it's it's that's not, you know... Um, something that I, I think people, I mean, need to worry about at this point, you know, so. On the National Guard, it represents somewhere approaching 50% of our combat power deployed overseas in these expeditionary activities. So we have proven that the militia, the National Guard, can handle combat operations full spectrum to include the most uh, intense, you know, highly trained MOSs like air traffic or pilot or or nuclear or whatever, they do those jobs. National Guard uh, soldiers do those jobs. And so um, I think that if we were to return our military back to a constitutional model, which was based not around big standing armies, 
right. not around that. Especially during forces. peacetime. We don't want big standing right. armies during peacetime because... But if we returned it back down to a, a militia model, a National Guard model, made sure that our National Guard had the funding that it needed to go to ranges and do the training that it needed to do, you'd get, you'd get, the, you'd get actually a greater level of defensive capability for a fraction of the cost. Yeah, you know, and, and, and of course, um, and now everyone should, of course, get their full benefits um, and, and not be cheated out of things like that. I, I mean, and um, and they should always get the best equipment. Um, we shouldn't be cheap about that either, I don't think. I mean, or I'm sure there's ways to save money, but... Um, well, President Washington, who, who is my one of my heroes, I know that there are more libertarian presidents out there than him, but he's one of my heroes, and he made it clear that one of the ways to preserve the peace is to be strong at home. Well, he didn't say, let's go invade France. He didn't say the way to be strong is to go get involved in all these European wars or world wars or any, you know, any of these other interventionisms. Um, he talked about having a strong military and a strong, uh, excuse me, a strong militia and a strong navy to protect our shipping interests in the high seas. And, and, and to use that to make it a deterrent for somebody to, to try to um, invade the United States. Or to, or, not just invade, but to, you know, take our shipping and so right. forth. It, because, obviously, we have, we have a duty to defend life, liberty, and property. And so, that's the kind of foreign policy that, that we ought to focus on talking about it's not a weak foreign policy, okay? It's not an anti-military foreign policy. It's a foreign policy that's based around defense, not offense. It's a foreign policy that's sustainable. It's a foreign policy that keeps us strong at home and in, 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 in our trade interests around the world. But it's one where we, be, where we stop, you know, invading other countries, occupying other countries, thinking that we can be the brokers of every little regional conflict. That has got to end. It's not sustainable. It's not constitutional. Our founding fathers would roll over in their graves. They knew we were doing. Yeah, that's uh, th that. Oh, so that's... and it's breaking the military. Okay, yeah. that's the other thing that needs to be said. It makes us weaker, not stronger. All of that stuff makes us weaker, and here's why: because of the of the reset cycles and the amount of of personnel and equipment that we expend on those efforts, and when I, when I say expend as a personnel, I don't just mean losing soldiers in the fight, I mean losing them through attrition because they, because they leave the service because they've been deployed four or five times and mama says that's enough, you're out, mm -hmm. okay? So now all that money that was spent training that soldier or that airman is gone, and it's a loss to the U.S. government, right? So when you when you operate the U.S. military at the operations tempo that it's been operated at for the last 10 years, it cannot help but start to break down. The equipment, the training, the personnel, it, it, it's, it's simply not sustainable. It's making us weaker, not stronger. And, and, and if, we, and if you know, people are out there arguing and talking about, well, what about Adam Dejan, what about Iran, and, and, and look, they're getting bolder and they're getting this and they're getting that. Well, what? well, because they see that we totally overextended ourselves. They see that we've literally borrowed trillions of dollars to do all this interventionism, and they're, and they're sitting there going, well, you know, we can now just go do whatever we want because the United States can't afford another war. And they're, and they're right. We can't afford another one. Yeah, we as a country need to, um, and our representatives um, who um, represent us need to... Um, show uh, the world that we are actually free um, and, and we're free from caring about um, uh, w what they think. Um, and, and so, y you know, it, it brings no shame or anything to just leave there. And, um, and actually, uh, it's, we, we, we know we're smart, <laughs> basically. And um, so we can and, come and to you know what else? You, you're exactly right. There's no, there, there's no, there's no shame in returning in the to the rule them of even law. More, yeah. You know, returning to the rule of law, reconstituting our strength, and and and, all, and not only that, but recommitting ourselves to what our founders said about, you know, honest friendship and free trade with all nations. I mean, you really want to, you really want to see 
um, you know, the United States have to be involved in less wars, then instead of taking flights with people, make them our trading ally. Trade with them. Dialogue with them. And then guess what happens? People that trade don't fight. There's no money in it. That's There's right. There's no profit yeah. to be made. Okay? Now, and, and people are like, oh, that's crazy talk. You can't talk that way about Iran. They want to, you know, kill people, this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, no, that's the propaganda machine talking. I bet we could make a lot of, um, you know, business deals, um, like legitimate, you know, honest business deals with um, Iran and a lot of those countries and uh, and have some prosperity for all. I mean, um, and, and, you know, have people actually enjoy life instead of spending, you know, I don't know what the statistics are, but probably 75 of the last 100 years have been in war or, you know, maybe the whole century, I mean, the whole century and just nonstop, you know, it's like the War of the Roses or something. It's just uh, one of these this whole last century. I mean, we've had a lot of peace in a lot of places, but there's definitely a lot of um, wars going on around the world, even in South America. I mean, we're all over South America as well, right? So, um, there's there's just no call for us to continue to, you know, invent wars to have to fight or invent conflicts to have to go. And yeah, some yeah. people say, like, oh, well, the war is good for our economy. I mean, um, well, even if it is, um, it's it's not, you know. Right, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's definitely not. It's destruction, and um, it, it's not construction. And um, I mean, it's it's if we have to do it, if someone's invading us, we will. But uh, and and Bob, you yeah, talked about why it's not good for the economy. Of course, Ron Paul said it too. Because you lose, it's it's a double loss. Okay, you lose the production of the free people who are actually having their production taken away from them to pay for a war effort. Okay, so you lose that. They could have been producing something else at a profit, but instead they're producing this, this stuff that's, that's going to be destroyed, right? And so you, you get the loss of production and you get the loss of, of what you made that's now gone, right? So you get like a double loss there. And when in reality those same producers could have been producing things that are then in, told, in turn resold or additional things are produced for them, additional services created. Um, but none of that cycle happens because the war is eating it up. Yeah, it could add a cumulative effect um, for sure. I mean, the, the, so the, 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 the losses are doubled losses while the gains could have been double the gains. So you kind of lose in both categories there, and, and that's not good. <laughs> Yeah. See, commerce, you know, commerce, you know, feeds itself. It builds on itself, right? Whereas war, you create the stuff, yeah, and there's this, there's these jobs of these people that do the, you know, do, do the making of the, the weapons and equipment and the jobs of the people that do the fighting, but those people die and that equipment gets destroyed. So now you got to put more people in and, and more, oh, you know, and, and more equipment out there to get destroyed. So it doesn't, it doesn't circulate. You see, it has no return value back into that commerce cycle. Yeah, it's it's almost like an ecosystem in a sense, and and a lot of the same kind of vocabularies there, sustainable, and um, it, it's it's a very natural thing, and it's almost alive in a sense, and uh, that's the free markets. Um, and um, just like, you, you, you know, nature and, and earth. Um, so, um, well, how about some just qu some quick issues here, just because uh, a lot of people like issues, a lot of people, you, you know, um, there's a lot of things going on. What about um, uh, industrial hemp? Um, and uh, I'll separate that from drug policy because that actually doesn't well, need you to don't, You don't have to with me. You don't have to with me because I'm not one of these typical... Um, you know, want to claim to be constitutional conservative Republicans out here who is afraid to touch issues like that. I'll tell you straight up, I want to end the drug war. If I'd have won the presidential nomination and won the presidential race after that, on day one of my presidency, I would have pardoned every single person locked up for nothing other than... Yeah, I mean, think of how many people would have been freed. I, I mean, you could almost make a movie out of it. I mean, it just, just if you captured for like just about three seconds of every single person that would be freed. I mean, I don't know how many hours that movie would be or, or whatever, but I mean, that's real Americans. We have more people incarcerated than, um, uh, you know, countries that have the word socialist in it, you know? Upwards of, upwards of 40 some odd percent 
of the American population has admitted to trying pot in their life. So what are we supposed to do? Lock up half the population, let the other half go broke paying for that? Well, that, that would be the only fair thing to do. I mean, that would be the, either that or free the other people. I mean, that would be the only just thing to do, including people who have admitted it on, in public, like uh, some of our elected officials. Um, I mean, I, that, to me, that, that's to me the main issue. It's so hypocritical, you know. And the progressives, the progressives of the early 1900s knew that they couldn't take out Holloway without a constitutional amendment. Right. But the progressives that we have today, and I, and I know this is the progressive libertarian or the libertarian progressive, I'm not trying to disparage anybody, but I'm referring to an actual historical political movement of the time, the temperance movement. And those people came in and said, we're going to take away alcohol, and we're going to have alcohol prohibition. Well, they at least knew it took a constitutional amendment to do that. Right. right. So today, we're fighting a trillions upon trillions of dollars of drug war. We've got, we got uh, moms and wives and fathers and husbands locked up in prison for nothing more than having a few ounces of, of, of uh, marijuana. You know? No, that's true, and not just that. I mean, having their homes raided, I mean, that that makes someone possibly lose a mortgage or something, have to go bankrupt, and, uh, I mean, it's just very, very um, uh, evil, I guess. I mean, that that's, you know, it's pretty evil, I think. And, and, all, because, and all because they smoke pot instead of drinking alcohol. Yeah. You know, so I'm not a person that limits my, my uh, defense of people's liberty, I mean, that's really where the empathy like comes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't I don't limit my defense of that to industrial hemp and say, oh, well, hemp doesn't have anything to do with pot, so that should be legalized. No, hemp should be legalized. Pot should be legalized. And you know what? It's not because I want to smoke dope. I have never even tried dope. I have no intention to start tomorrow, and most people don't. You legalize dope tomorrow, and people would not run out. But with the percentage of people who have, you at least know somebody who has, and you wouldn't want to see them locked up, would you? Like, I'm sure you know a lot of ones or or, or someone who's related to you who has, and I'm sure everyone, if, if like, half the population has tried it, I'm sure everyone knows a loved one um, Mm -hmm. or has tried it themselves who they, they wouldn't want to see in prison for how long some of these people are in there for. But I say it that way because I, I, I just I always have these conservatives, usually social conservatives, that come at us like, "Oh, you guys are just a bunch of you know hippie pot smokers, and you just want to legalize pot so you can smoke pot and get high all the time." Like, I've never even tried. You're it. just aware enough to like uh, you, you know be proud of the truth. I think you know, and yeah. uh, maybe I, I'm yeah. proud of people of, of people's freedom. Okay, and I I accept the fact that some people will use their freedom in ways with which I do not agree. They may do they may do things that I don't like, they may they may have lifestyles I don't I don't personally agree with. But hey, that's freedom. That's liberty. And the opposite of that is tyranny and oppression. And I'm and I'm not going to oppress and oppress people and tyrannize them just to try to make them live the way I think they ought to live. Yeah, no, that's and, and um and uh, you know what? I, I consider myself more of a constitutionalist than anything either. And right now, you're actually an independent. You ran as um, a libertarian candidate for uh, presidency, but um, but thought Gary Johnson would do a good job this year. And and so now you're running actually as an independent, right? Um, is am I correct in that? Well, that, yeah, that, that's kind of a convoluted tale. All but you know, I was I, I ran as a libertarian for president and. I probably would have stayed a libertarian, but a couple of unfortunate things happened in my state. The first one was the Oklahoma Libertarian Party came about 10,000 votes shy, or not votes, signature shy of getting on the ballot, recognized as a party. And then in the aftermath of that, and, you know, um, happened to make some very quick decisions once Gary Johnson became the clear presumptive nominee and going ahead of me and all the, and all the, you know, polling and stuff, I realized, look, I've got to, if I'm going to try to do something in my home state, um, I had to make a decision by April, and and so I, I had to make some quick moves to, to make certain things happen, and uh, in making that happen, uh, unfortunately, um, and inadvertently, the Oklahoma State LP chair didn't get the proper notification or whatever it is he wanted and said, oh, okay, well, we don't recognize R.J. as a libertarian congressional candidate because he didn't come and ask. 
Okay. So, well, you know what? There's kind of a, um, a, a neat thing about being an independent, too, I mean, I suppose, you know. Um, and, uh, and, so, yeah, and, I still consider myself a libertarian, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, on the on the paper, I'm an independent because that's what the state of Oklahoma required, so I could get on the ballot. And you know, one guy does not make the Oklahoma Libertarian Party. Unfortunately, he's the one calling the shot right now. But I, I don't I don't let that dictate that I'm not libertarian. I mean, yes, technically I'm an independent, but you know, when I win my race in November, I would I would very much love to be able to especially if Johnson, uh, Governor Johnson won his race as well, that would automatically get the Libertarian Party recognized in the state of Oklahoma, and I could just stand up and say I'm a Libertarian right then and there. Oh, yeah, and I hope that happens, uh, too. Um, yeah, so uh, absolutely, and, um, and and you might help um, even other smaller parties as well, all, all third parties and... and um, so I mean, there's been a lot that I mean, right now they're, they try to keep the after Ross Pro was in the debates in '92. He did such a good job as an independent candidate running against Clinton and and the first George Bush that they transferred like the you know who um, uh, does the coordination for the debates from the League of Women Voters to um, like a pri you know a corporation where there's two heads and one's a Democrat and one's a Republican and. Um, I mean, uh, and one thing you gotta love about Ron Paul, I mean, I love the man. But one thing that just happens that is just w right on par with what we're talking about right now is he's made libertarian a good word again. Like all the media, they just they don't even hide it. They just call him libertarian. Like you, you saw in all this stuff that happened this past week. Whenever the media talk about him, they just call him the libertarian Republican candidate, and that's not a bad word now. Everybody knows okay, libertarian that means you're a Ron Paul person. Now, I know there's some libertarians out there that don't agree with everything Ron Paul says. I don't agree with everything. The heck, I don't agree with everything I say, you know. I mean, there's always disagreement. There's always disunity and disharmony in certain things in life. I mean, that's just part of life. But That's healthy. You know, yeah, I think, I mean, it, it uh, helps people learn. Um, and, um, and and I guess if we knew it all, it, it's uh, we wouldn't even need any government or anything, right? You know, but the fact is the most constitutionally conservative, you know, con congressman in the last hundred years, you know, the one that's been called even by his opponents, to be the founding father of our age, he's a libertarian. The media just openly calls him a libertarian now. I mean, how much good can that do for the party? How much can that do for the liberty movement? When people go, okay, when you say libertarian, you mean this guy Ron Paul or people like him? Yeah, now, love him or hate him. And, and I don't really know, as a matter of fact, I don't really know anybody that hates him. The only people that hate him won't admit it. It's like the Republican establishment. You know, the, 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 the Mitt Romney suck-ups. Okay, those are the people that hate, uh, hate Ron Paul, but even they won't say it in public. Well, he did huge in <laughs> Iowa, and it's it's like, um, I, I mean, and that was a first um, a contest, and... Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, and, and one thing the media didn't cover, I mean, he kind of did like a tour around the country this summer. Um, uh, he, I mean, he went, he went to like Pennsylvania. He had a couple thousand people show up there, a couple thousand people in New York, a um, couple thousand people in, um, I think, uh, Wisconsin and also in, in um, Kansas and as well as Washington and a couple places in um, uh, California and, and in Texas. I mean, I mean, he he was having like you know some places like five thousand at least people show up, and uh, I mean, and it's is pretty amazing. It kind of reminded me of um, uh, Warren Harding. He had people like I guess he couldn't travel around much, but people would come to his um, residence actually like in the thousands, and he would do Q and As and speeches and stuff like that, and. Uh, he actually claims that we need a, 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 it was a return to normal. And that kind of yeah. reminds me of a um, thing I always hear, like a new normal. Um, you, you know, maybe we need a new, new normal <laughs> again, you know. and um, but In the aftermath of the way that GOP treated him this past week, and well, for months now, but definitely this last week, I think that the Liberty Movement and the Libertarian Party is about to explode. I think, I, I think it is. It's going to go up the charts, and a lot of people are going to leave the Republican Party. Um, maybe it's a trickle at first, but the floodgates are going to open, and that's going to be that. I mean, um, I think some, I think there might be a. a I mean, if the heads of Congress were like Ron Paul against Dennis Kucinich, um, and, and they were all of those kind of people's ilk, um, I mean, I'd 
be much happier with the, with that as well. But I mean, I I'm an independent. I, I love the Libertarian Party, and I definitely lo- am going to be supporting Gary Johnson in this um, election season. But um, I have done a lot of interviews with Green Party people as well. Um, I've been trying to do districts where. Um, there's just one uh, independent person running against, you know, right. who's on the ballot or a third party person. And uh, but um, so I, I, you know, just any if anyone's in that same district, I think it's also to their benefit um, to elect someone who's constitutional. Uh, it's definitely going to help you, you, by you getting in there. That's going to help other third parties as well. It's also going to help people as a whole. And um, I so it, it's it's. And it's a lot of these proposals, it might hurt some people, like maybe the big banks, the insiders, but 95% of businesses and people out there, the super overwhelming majority, should, um, you, you, you know, be, uh, this is all, it should be in their best interest, I, I think. Um, yeah. More freedom, hey, less taxes. And let me clear something up, too, and that is my first inclination and instinct is to be an independent. And the reason why is because you know, you can go out there and define yourself with your rhetoric, rhetoric and your policy statements and your positions on the issue. And you can get that information out there now through the social media and other outlets that you could never have before. And so you almost don't need the parties. To, you, you really don't, in this day and age, need the parties anymore to define what kind of candidate you are um, as, you, as you might have won. So the only thing they really have left is a value a lot of times to simply ballot access. Um, but my first inclination is to say, let's follow what George Washington said and Thomas Jefferson said and not even mess around with these parties because they just, they mess everything well, up. Well, it's necessary nowadays to have some competition against those, um, y- you know, megalists, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats or who appear to be, but really their power is just as much as you give it to them. I, I mean, you, you know, they only have power, they have a 10% approval rating, but they only have power if people um, uh, are apathetic or that fearful light, or, you know. That light switch needs to go off in their head. They need to realize, oh my gosh, I, I mean, oh, everybody uses the internet now. Well, most everybody. I mean, you've got a whole bunch of folks near in the 55 to 75 year range that are still slow. That's true. Getting That's a, very true. Getting a, and, and those folks vote a lot, okay? But what I'm trying to say is that that epiphany needs to happen on a societal level, on a societal level, where people have that light bulb go off and go, my gosh, I don't have to go to the Democrat or the Republican Party to find my candidate. I can just go in here, type into Google, Oklahoma Congressional Candidates for District, there's my candidate. Oh, all three of them have websites. Let me just go read what they have to say and pick one. Absolutely. When that epiphany goes off in everyone's head, when everyone realizes that they don't have to watch Fox News to be told who to vote for, when they don't have to watch CNN, or they don't have to listen to all the BS and all the all, all of the spin, they can literally just go type into Google, find their candidate, go to that person's Facebook page or website, read what they have to say, and make a choice. When people do that, it's going to change. It's going to change everything. And it can we're just happen not in an instant. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. Well, it can happen in an instant. Um, I mean, there couldn't be a better um, time timing right now. I mean, that they're on the run. They have a 10% approval rating. Most people are registered independents. Um, I, I mean, th- this is um, the, the the time to, to, to do it. And and thankfully, people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they they made the House of Representatives uh, a house where elections are every two years. And and that's the super part about it. Two years because that's an emergency button. That's what that two years is that two years yeah. that that's like the emergency breaks that's what why we have that for two years and um and so i mean it could happen instantly we might get 100 people i mean i, I would like to see at least 50 independent third party candidates elected to congress one representing each state you might have more from some states but just one representing that as a metaphor but i mean maybe you, you know maybe there'll be a lot more maybe there'll be 100 i mean people you know there's the silent shoppers out there and people that are younger you do need to talk to your aunts uncles or whoever and 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 share this knowledge that they might not be getting from you know bring your laptop over and show show them some videos or something i mean that they might not be getting from fox news and stuff and uh yeah yeah i mean we're, we're really close i mean that's that's how a guy like me is even in this fight right now 
is the internet, social networking, and you know, about a decade ago, this wouldn't be maybe five years ago, this wouldn't be possible. But it is now, so we're, we're right on the leading edge of it, and that's one more reason why I didn't want to let April go by without filing to run for Congress in my district, um, because I realized that we're coming to a time that if you can literally just get your message out there on the internet, you might actually win that race. So um, I just I didn't want to let it go by that the, that the people of my district didn't have a choice. Um, and I'm, so I'm a, in the aftermath of this GOP convention. I'm already starting to see a big increase in um, in, in the in the voters' attention with the race now. Like all the way up until now, people haven't been paying attention. But now that the, um, one of the major parties has had its had its convention, everybody's like brain is gone. Okay, well now we've got an election in two months. Right. Uh, now and, and of course that'll kick into overdrive maybe like two weeks or a week out from the election. It's literally possible for a, for a candidate like me that has as much internet presence as I do to win this election in the last two weeks just from all the people going and popping, you know, they, they haven't really been paying attention. They've been working and taking care of the kids and, and you know, getting them off to school and, and, and football practice. And, and then, you know, a week before the election, they go and sit down and they type in Oklahoma 4th District, and you know what they're going to see? They're going to see that I dominate that result. I mean, they're not even going to see Tom Cole, a four-term congressman, they're going to see his website pop up. You know, all the results in that first page of results are from stuff that we, that we wrote here in this campaign. Well, we can win on just that last week alone, just people doing that, just going in there and Google searching the candidates and going, oh, man, this guy's everywhere. Yeah, and if someone says, like, I don't have a, can you know, like a Liberty candidate in my district, support someone like R.J. Harris here um, and uh, rjharris2012.com. And um, it, it's it, it you're helping yourself even so. I mean that's ex exactly like why so many because people think, are yeah. fans of Ron Paul. I mean he's I don't live in Texas, but you know what? I mean I see. Yeah, he fought for our liberty even from the 14th district of Texas. Right. That's a very good point. You know, it almost doesn't matter that I'm going to be from the 4th district of Oklahoma if somebody's in this Maine. This is a national they campaign. Can a donation, Absolutely. They can still get on Facebook and do and repost my blog, my posts and stuff because you know what? Am I going to be fighting for their liberty? You betcha. Yeah. I'm going to be fighting for the liberty of every American, regardless of what district they come from. Now, I'm going to be representing the people of the 4th District. Course. Make no mistake about that. But I'm also going to be fighting for everybody's freedom, no matter where they live in this country. To me, and, I, and, and that's a lot more we important. We understood that about Ron Paul. I mean, that's why he, you know, he, he was a, yeah, he was a presidential candidate, but he was a congressman, and everybody loved what he was doing for us in Congress, no matter where we came from in the, country, in the nation. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, I saw this one C-SPAN call-in show where they have just people calling in from left, right, and 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 independents, and um, and just everyone was like, you you know, uh, pro Ron Paul and stuff. It was it was amazing uh, call-in. It was like a whole hour of that. They couldn't stop it, and uh, yeah, it was, it's he he really um, had the uh, he he you know this he he. You know, started something, and it now it's time. He's not done. I mean, I mean, it's it's this this is a, a part of it. So, I mean, it's a national campaign. There's candidates in all 50 states. The thing is to try to get as many people in the Congress as possible. And um, no matter where we're at, because uh, you know, having 50, that's the media is not. That's going to be a revolution right there, and um, that's going to spark the flame of liberty um, that's going to uh, uh, burn um, and, and uh, y y y you know, uh, I guess be good. Um, so, and so, and so we talked about a couple other issues. What about, um, I mean, we went through foreign policy, the, the budgets, um, civil liberties, yeah, I mean, the, the, the police states, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, it actually was just a spending bill, but they added something onto it that was um, that should have not been. And um, like indefinite detention, they added that onto a spending bill. And um, the Patriot Act, uh, it, it, the TSA, um, you, you know, the, uh, the Homeland uh, Security, um, 
our, our Fourth Amendment rights, our First Amendment rights, um, legal searches and seizures, uh, a fair trial. I mean, all, all these uh, fundamental issues that are, um, I, I, it it's almost seems like uh, they're, you, you know, being uh, tested um, and, and seeing if, um, you, you know, they can be overturned without passing a constitutional amendment. Well, yeah, it, yeah, make, make no mistake. They, um, they have been trampling the Constitution, stealing our freedom and liberty. Um, but, you know, Ron, Ron is not going to be the be-all, end-all of this movement. I mean, he got us, he, he kept the, he kept the flame alive when, when it was bitter cold outside, and then he, he got it cooking again. But, um, I talked to him on the phone a couple of years back, and he let me know then, person to person, hey, listen, a new generation of Liberty candidates is going to have to step up and take over, because I'm not going to be here forever. I mean, he told me that. So... And, and now here we are. We got Governor Johnson ready to t- ready to have the torch passed. And uh, I've, got, I've got a lot of high hopes for him in this presidential race. We've got myself. We've got a lot of other Liberty candidates out there. There are people to support. And, and I know because Ron Paul already told me personally and directly that that's what's got to come now. It, so, it does. I mean, uh, the fruits of this Tea Party Occupy Wall Street, it's got the, the, I mean, that's a good start and that brings attention. I don't think it's a waste of time to, to protest at all. I mean, that's actually necessary to put the heat on and, and express our rights, be in town halls, be involved. But the fruits of this labor has got to end up being um, having, you, you know, people that represent us and, and, and voting people in that have our best interests in mind and, and you know, I like the Constitution. And what I'd like people to do is coalesce around their liberty candidates. I mean, the temptation is to go out there and start this group and start this group and start promoting your own agenda and uh, so on and so forth. But you know what? You know what's really going to change and restore this republic is getting liberty of candidates elected at all levels who know and understand the constraints of the Constitution that's placed upon the power of their office they know and understand that the reason why they're running for office is to protect and defend the liberty and freedom of the people and nothing more. And so if you get those people to start getting them elected at all levels, then that's really what's going to help restore this whole republic, restore this constitutional governance. And so I would just encourage people to get out there and fight and help your local liberty candidates or your national liberty candidates. That's where I would really like to see and hope people's energy would be focused. Um, of course, the Tea Party movement all got started, but what did it do? It just aggrandized itself. It, it wouldn't promote any candidates. It wouldn't endorse any candidates. It just, it just, and then it got co-opted by the Republican Party, and now it's, it's like petered out into nothing. You know, I mean. But those people are still there. I mean, those are probably the same people that were supporting Ross Pro. I mean, this has been brewing for a while. I mean, we've had the lesser of two evils for about 20 years. And, um, I mean, the, the kettle's about to um, hum here. And um, well, so we can't, we can't have people keep saying that they just want to participate in educational processes and they just want to participate in, you know, uh, uh, you know educating the voter or, you know, or not really picking sides, not really backing candidates, and I totally right. disagree. I, we I, have I, to start backing liberty candidates with our money, with our votes, with our time, so that way those people can take on the machine. And unfortunately right now that machine is big and it's nasty and it's greasy and it's ugly and it's a tough fight. But there are some candidates out there willing to get dirty and get in that fight, and, and I would just really hope that when people are making a decision about how to get involved politically, that they just take one straight look at the Liberty Candidates, go to the Liberty Candidates Facebook page, go to their website, and go and find your Liberty Candidates and help them because that is who is going to be who can change this stuff. Yeah, I, if, I, when I'm looking up candidates... In your area, yeah. If you don't have a Libertarian candidate, then you become the Liberty Candidate in your area. That's okay? true, too. yeah, yeah. There's actually, there's about 70%, I would guess. I've, I've looked up a lot of candidates, and that's one of the main focuses, too, is that, I mean, this can be a national campaign. 
in a sense, I mean, in this time of day and age, in 2012, in the situation where we're at, and um, but you can go to the, there's an FEC website which has the uh, links right to all the secretaries of states or departments of elections, and then you can look to see like who's all the candidates in your entire state, and then you can also go to vote. Uh, smart.org um, that's a, another cool. great place so you just type in a, a zip code and and it'll tell you I think that's been like 99 percent accurate um, the Libertarian Party website lp.org um, I mean I, I looked at that list there it took me hours to go through that list and um, and uh, y y you know and, and GP greenparty.org gp.org um, they have a similar listing I mean there is so many candidates out there. I mean, there's a lot of choices. Seventy percent, I would say, just a rough estimate. I mean, that, that's, you know, and that's how many districts probably have uh, some kind of liberty candidates. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah. It's a lot. It, it's enough. It's enough um, that, y y you know, we, it, it, it can... Uh, do do we can do what we need to do, and uh, I mean that's enough. I mean it, it would be good to have a hundred percent, of course, or ninety percent, or ninety-five. But um, uh, that option is there. And um, so you said you um, admired George Washington. Um, any other like uh, historical figures that, um, or are are you more like into the moment, or you know, I guess um, do you like history a lot, or? Well. Um yeah, I, I pretty much uh, very much respect George Washington. I could, you know, I could say the same thing to a lesser extent for our, for most most of the founding fathers and um, founding presidents. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot of reasons to like Thomas Jefferson, and and of course, there's 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 reasons to to like and, and dislike all these guys. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah, you know, I'm not putting anybody on a pedestal. Just telling the truth, yeah. I mean, yeah. just, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I like the fact, you know, that Andrew Jackson ended the first U.S. bank. I hate the fact that he committed the Trail of Tears. You know, I mean, uh, but I definitely like the fact that he ended the first U.S. bank. Yeah, so, and, and it's not like you're him, I mean, you, you know, so you can look at it in an objective way, um, and, uh, you, you know, so... Um, and he might have regretted that later. Who knows? I don't know. You know, but um, and, but and he's an interesting figure for sure. Yeah. For but I, 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 when you talk about history, I kind of gravitate towards. Uh, I kind of really like. I mean, I like to go all the way back to Pelagius. I mean, you had Pelagius who was killed, you know, for heresy by the Catholic Church, like way back in the early. I've heard of him? Yeah, I don't, I don't recall like right but, away. You know, if you if you go Google search him, you're going to find him, and he's going to be. He's one of these uh, Catholic philosophers slash theologians from, I, I, I can't, I, it's like in the early uh, few centuries of the late Roman Empire and um, and uh, Holy Roman Empire as it got going. And, and he was one of these people that argued for freedom, for, you know, individual liberty. And, of course, he had some, uh, he had some theological things that he said in the Catholic Church wanted that wound up uh, not liking him for too much and we all know what happened with that but um, but I, I, I really like to go back that far you know I like to go back and, and try to trace how this freedom's torch has been passed all this time you know it's really amazing to see that even in times whenever it, it, it's never really gone all the way out you know it's always there's always a remnant sometimes it flares up real big like it did in the US Revolution and then in the Found in the Republic so forth, and then there's times when it gets real small, and and um, so yeah, I mean, I do like history. I like to cool, cool, and uh, now it's got inspiration from it. Yeah, abs it's very interesting, um, and, and they, you know they say those who don't, it, it's it's a way to um, be efficient because you can learn from it, um, and, and now you can also take a grain of salt. It doesn't mean it has to set any kind of precedent per se, but uh, you, you, you know you can save time, I guess, by learning from other people's mistakes, possibly, um, and. Um, so I, so yeah, it can be helpful and inspiring, and uh, it's a way where you can communicate with people regardless of the age. If if they had like written stuff that's still around, it's like you're still reading from someone's direct thoughts and that they wrote down from years ago. It's kind of like speaking on the internet, except that this post was made, you know, like a thousand years ago, you know. 
man. So. And I think I've already mentioned, you know, about the art. I, I have great respect about the art. I, I have uh, read as much of him as I can. I've still got some more from him to read. Um, but I really uh, like what he had to say on monetary policy and economics and trade. And Well, heck, he talked about foreign policy. He talked about just a lot of the stuff we're talking about here. So, I mean, a lot of people kind of pigeonholing it to being in economics, but I think he can talk about a lot more than that. Well, what's, what are some of, like, the cool places um, in the 4th District in Oklahoma? Um, if I yeah. Well, I'll start off with my, with my town, um, Norman, Oklahoma. You've got the University of Oklahoma in Norman, um, and I'm very uh, happy to be a, an alum from the University of Oklahoma uh, philosophy program and from the College of Law. And it's a, it's a beautiful school and beautiful campus, and, of course, everybody's heard of their football team. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so, I mean, you've got Norman, and they're working out from there. You've got um, you've got Moore, which is just a little bit north of, of Norman, and it's a, a prospering community uh, that's on the kind of the outskirts of Oklahoma City. You might call it a suburb, if, if you will. Um, and then small parts of southern Oklahoma City are in the district as well, and but then as you go um, south, oh, of course, you've got Tinker Air Force Base in the district. And whenever I need to go to um, uh, to to do anything, you know, sometimes I might have to go, you know, do something with the uh, military at, a, at, a, at, a, at an active duty installation. Tinker is the closest one. And uh, so you've got Tinker Air Force Base in the district. And if you go south, You'll get to, um, you got Lawton. Lawton's got Fort Sill and all the history that surrounds Fort Sill and the Native American nations that are, that are in that area. Like my, my, I'm an Iowa, uh, Iowa Indian from the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma, and, and of course, there's a lot of history with my tribe and other tribes at Fort Sill. And, um, of course, the, uh, the, the Iowa headquarters is just outside of the fourth district. Um, so my, my, Tribal headquarters isn't in the district, but it's um, it's real close. And we've got um, uh, the armory where, where I drill at is in Lexington, Oklahoma, and there's this nice little um, place called Lexington and Purcell, and they're really close together. And and uh, they're where one of the land, one of the land rushes kicked off from from Purcell, and you know, they have that you know, kind of pinned up on one of their old buildings down there in Merle for that. And, um, so that's a nice little place. And then if you go, you know, you go further south, you get Ardmore and Ada and all the way down to the Red River. And it's just a lot of, you know, beautiful outdoorsy things to do and places to go and lakes to water ski on or fish off of. And, and, yeah, uh, sounds really nice. Yeah, that sounds it's, like... It's a, a nice little piece of country, I'd say, and... And a lot of good people in it, and, and and you know, trying my best to to win them over to the concept of smaller, liberty-based, constitutionally based government. And um, what's what's funny is, believe it or not, a lot of a lot of conservatives get that, um, but they're. They're tempted, oftentimes, to use the government to get their way socially. You know, to to talk about morality and things like this. And and as that applies to your family, great. You know, raise your children up as you think they ought to go. But you know, you can't use the government to tell other people how to live. So you know, while I want to be the representative for the district, I also want to be out there um, restoring and reinvigorating that that, you know, that little flame of liberty and just reminding everybody that, you know, what made this country great, what made our republic so great was the, the freedom to fail, the freedom to make wrong decisions, and the capability and ability to make really good and right decisions and be very profitable at the same time. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's some things that will expand the consciousness of this nation and um, get us... Um, uh, to uh, recognizing the um, our Bill of Rights um, and natural rights is um, 
is, you know, ending the war on drugs on 50% on of the population and, and their uh, relatives and um, the, the other half that hasn't done any and um, having a sensible foreign policy, a balanced budget and uh, having the government protect our civil liberties instead of um, uh, invading them, basically. And, I mean, just doing that, I think um, things are just going to kind of uh, get back to, uh, you, you know, the way they should be. So, um, yeah, who knows, maybe even a, another renaissance of a type, you know, with, with the, uh, d you know, it could create such a momentum, possibly. But, um, uh, well, uh, RJ, it's great talking with you. It's, um, I mean, so, you know, people need to uh, visit rjharris2012.com. Well, that would be one way to contact you. And um, so any, you know, events, organizers and, and stuff like that. Well, actually, I have seen you on, you, you know, a few different uh, things. But, um, but I mean, it seems like, you know, you're very honest and, um, and uh, you know, re recognize the truth as um, being important and um, willing to debate issues and uh, uh, be forefront um, and, and, and get on the ballots and, and be willing to stop, um, be a representative that can help stop, uh, you know, the kind of policies we've had for the last 12 years and take your pick on an issue. I mean, it's just been, you know, one thing after another. and. Um, uh, and just again, I mean, uh, your opponents did vote for the NDAA, um, so I, I don't know if um, he knew what all was in it. But either way, that's uh, yeah, I definitely do, and I know that yeah. I know that uh, you know that my you know my opponent's voting record makes even the conservatives in my district sick. Yeah. So you know, voting for the bailouts, voting for the stimulus package. You know, voting for Obama's budget, voting to raise the debt limit, voting for the NDAA, NDAA voting for the SLPA. I mean, the list just is, is so long and... and yeah, and internet and privacy and all that. It, it's, um, I, I mean, he could be a nice guy. That's fine. I, I, you know, um, I, I, it, even though he broke his oath to the Constitution, I would say, I would just say let him just go home and back into the private sector and, and let's get somebody who's serious, um, who's sincere and, and, and serious, and uh, knows what the Constitution's about. Um, you know, All right. Well, it's been a pleasure being on, on, on you tonight, on, on with you tonight in this interview, and uh, look forward to it again, and I uh, and, uh, hope everybody listening to this on your website will, like you say, visit my website, rjrs2012.com, and, and hopefully they'll... Um, They'll uh, let their friends know in Oklahoma that there's a Liberty candidate here to support. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, have a nice weekend. Um, Godspeed. And I'll say goodbye to you real quick after I uh, end this interview here. And thanks again, okay. um, RJ Harris, uh, uh, 2012.com. All right.